Here's a good question for us to think about. And it's a question we'll probably look at more on a Sunday night in the future. But why is it as Christian people, why is it that we are supposed to meet on the Lord's Day for? We have this beautiful building, this beautiful facility. We make it a habit to come to attend Sunday services. Well, why is it that we do this for? Is it tradition? Why is it that we attend like we do on the Lord's Day and other times as well, services, special occasions, Wednesday nights? Well, when we look at the Bible, it's much more than a tradition. It is a tradition, but not all traditions are bad, amen? It's a Bible tradition. It's traditional that we come, we meet on the Lord's Day, we meet and worship together, yes, And the Bible would tell us there's many purposes for us meeting here this morning. But what I want to do today is look at one purpose that maybe some of us haven't thought too much of, and it's this purpose of singing. Why do we meet together on the Lord's Day? Though there's many things that can be said, one thing that should clearly be said is that we have met together because God wants us to sing together. That doesn't mean all of us can sing a special like Miss Virginia just did. Um, that doesn't mean everybody can, can do things like that. But all of us can make a melody to the Lord. At the retirement home last week, I was telling them, somebody there I think was saying, you know, I just can't sing very well. And I said, well, all you have to do is make a joyful noise unless you're the song leader. And of course, I'm the song leader there. So it's expected for me to do more, but I can't do more than that. But the fact is, God commands us and wants us to come together and to sing. Why is that for? And that's what we're going to see today. And we're going to see it from Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Now, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 is not going to answer every question that we have. It's not going to give us everything we may want to have on this topic. It's going to speak to other things, but it certainly does speak to this fact that we are to call together and sing together as we meet by the calling of God. This verse specifically, certainly does speak to this. This verse speaks to us as individuals in different aspects. That's for sure. But this verse also speaks to us corporately. When I say corporately, what that means, we're gathered together. We are a corporate body. We are one body together and we meet, we worship, we sing, we do these other things as we do as we meet. Well, look here in verse 16 with me today. I want us to see four main things from this verse. And here's the first one I want us to see is what the foundation of our singing must be. What must the foundation of our singing be as Christian people? Verse 16, Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. That is the foundation. For us who are Christians, we have not just simply showed up today to have a singing contest. You know, unbelievers can come in and sing far better than I can. Unbelievers can come in and sing, and yet that singing is not pleasing to the Lord. What we see in verse 16 is the foundation of all Christian singing. It's this. Let, that word let there is a command. Let, so we have a part to play in this. Let the word of Christ richly, not just here and there, but in fullness, richly dwell within you. So as Christians today, what we must be doing in our normal life is allowing this Word of God or this message of Christ to dwell in its fullness, to dwell richly in our heart throughout the week. Sunday mornings is not a time for worship. Every day is a time for worship. Amen? Every day is a time of worship. In fact, if we go throughout our weeks and throughout the week and we are not worshiping God as, as we ought to and as the Bible wants us to, when we come on Sunday mornings, many times we're just not going to feel like worshiping. Why? Well, we haven't done it throughout the week. Our whole life is worship. 
Now, when we come to worship and, and our heart is cold, maybe it's a spiritual problem we have. Maybe it's a physical thing we're still, we're dealing with. We're just simply not as excited. We're, we're down physically. That still does not give us the right not to worship, right? We come, it's like one man talked about, we come here to worship and we come to sing praises to God. And if our heart is not in it like it ought to be, what we must do as a people is say, God is worth this regardless of the way that I feel. If the governor, some of you met the governor recently, haven't you? If the governor or if the president came to you at a time that you felt down, I think you would find the inward power to get up and say, yes, Mr. Governor, yes, am I right about I'm right about that, right? Well, there's times when I come to service and for whatever reason, my heart just feels out of it. Maybe I had to do something all night and I'm tired. And listen, when you're tired, you can't hardly do anything about it, can you? I know what it is to sit through a service and be so tired. I remember a time in a different state listening to a very good preacher and I'm so tired I can barely keep my eyes open. There's not much you can do, right? I mean, that's just reality. That's life. And yet, there's been times when I've come to worship service and my heart's cold, is not in it, but God is worthy. And I say, Lord, it doesn't matter if I feel anything or not, I am here. And I'm going to worship You because You're worthy of it. This Word dwelling in our hearts is the foundation of everything that happens in our corporate singing together. It's in our heart, therefore, like the Apostle said, I have believed, therefore we have spoken. Well, we have had the Word dwell within us, therefore we must speak the Word out and worship and praise God. Ephesians chapter 5, in one sense at least, is a parallel to this. Let me read verse 18 and 19 to us. The Bible says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So we are filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5. In Colossians 3, we are filled with the Word of God. They go together. The person who is filled with the Spirit is at the same time going to be filled with the Word of God. And the person who is filled with the Word of God is going to be a person filled with the Spirit of God. This is the foundation for our life. Do you remember in Exodus when, when God began to give the people manna from heaven? The Bible says there, morning by morning they went and gathered as much as they needed. And here's the fact of it. Now this is, I'm using this as an illustration. Those people in the Old Testament, when they gathered manna six days a week and rested on the seventh, the Bible says whatever they had left over on those other days would rot. Do you remember that? And in our life, it's basically the same thing. I may have had a great time with the Lord, a great time of prayer and Bible reading on Friday morning. And God lifted me up to heaven. But when I get up on Saturday morning, if I'm just going to rely on what happened yesterday or the week before, I'm going to find out it's rot. It's not going to do its work. Morning by morning, or however you in your own life, because we all have different schedules, we're all made differently, but day by day, we need to be feeding on God's Word. Am I right? Day by day, we go to God in prayer. Day by day, we read His Word. We've had a dry spell lately. And that's an understatement. The grass is turning brown. It's on its way to dying. But you know what? In my backyard, I've got some green grass. And the reason for that is I've got two peach trees. And I've got some mounds, like someone suggested to me, put up around these peach trees. And I take my water hose and I fill up these mounds full of water. It sits there and it soaks down. Why is my grass green? It's because I'm soaking it with water. And how can our souls be green in this sin-cursed world? It's by soaking our souls in the Word of God and in prayer. 
If you find a man or woman, boy or girl, who is, is zealous for God, somebody who is passionate about the Lord and about serving Him, about loving people and helping people's needs, you are finding a man, woman, boy or girl that is passionate about the Word of God. The Word is dwelling in their hearts. Now some of you may struggle with this. And like I said, we all have different schedules. We're made differently. Some of us are more of morning people. Some of us are more night people. You have to know yourself in this. But I would suggest if you struggle with these things, don't commit to read ten chapters of the Bible before work tomorrow. Or don't commit to pray an hour tomorrow. But commit to truly come to God in your heart. To truly, when you read the Bible, it may just be a chapter. It may be less than a chapter. But commit, when you read, you're going to feast on God's Word. Listen to His voice and obey what He says. When you Maybe you struggle with prayer. Maybe you're going to begin to pray daily now. Maybe that's in your heart. Well, like I said, don't start out saying, I'm going to pray an hour or two every day. Now, you may start that way. But what I would say to you is this. Just have a time of prayer in the beginning where you can pour out your heart to God. And you maybe you're getting up for work in the morning and you may only have a short time. Well, make those 10 to 20 minutes count for the Lord. Make sure your heart is not thinking about the day's activities. Make sure your heart's not thinking about the hobby or entertainment you may be participating in later that week or day. But make sure your heart is set upon the Lord. And that you're going to read His Word and obey it and love it and give your attention to it. That's one reason that worship can be very difficult. Everything we do in life ought to be worship. But one reason worship is difficult is because worship takes our whole being. You can read the news while you talk to somebody else. You can do your favorite hobby while you think about something else. You can be at the dinner table with your family while your mind's on two other things from that same day. But when we come to God, our minds and hearts cannot be wandering for it to be worship. Our, now if you're here and sometimes in prayer you struggle and all of a sudden you just realize you've been thinking about something for 30 seconds. I do that at times. I don't want to do that. I struggle. I struggle with that. Maybe you're here, you're reading the Bible. And as you read the Bible, you pause, and before you know it, you've spent 60 seconds or two minutes thinking about something else, and you have to shake yourself. Well, we are humans. We struggle with that. We're fallen humans. And yet what I want to say is this. Don't let that discourage you. Get back into the Word. Get back into prayer. Make sure your heart is set on the Lord. John 15, before we move on, let me turn there. We're talking about still this foundation, the Word of God dwelling in your hearts. Let me, <laughs> let me say this real quick. The older I'm getting as a preacher, the longer I'm preaching. Don't say, don't say anything about that. When I first started preaching, I'd preach 20, 25 minutes or so, and people loved me. But I'm finding now, as I preach, the time just keeps moving faster. But that's okay. John chapter 15. We're talking about the Word of God dwelling in our hearts richly. Well, one way is to put the Word in it, right? We have to read the Word. We have to pray. We, we spend time with God. All of our time should be with God, but we, we focus certain times upon Him. Well, look in John 15. How else can the Word of God dwell within us? Verse 7, If you abide in Me and My words abide in you, ask what, whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So here, the Word of God abides in you. But look down in verse 10 now. If you keep My commandments, you will abide in My love. How are you going to have the Word of God dwelling in your heart richly? Well, you've got to put it there. But you have to obey it. That's how 
the Word of God is going to dwell richly within us. You know, sometimes we, we and myself included, I get these big schemes of what I'm going to do spiritually in the future. But what am I going to do at the dinner table when someone says something I don't like? And at that moment, I've got to decide, am I going to fall after the Spirit and be patient? Or if I'm going to have to go off into the flesh and say something I shouldn't say? See, obedience is much more than are we going to go witness to somebody next week. Obedience is, how am I going to treat my family today? How am I going to love my neighbors today? How am I going to keep my thoughts pure today? How am I going to do this? It's all of life. And moment by moment by moment, as we obey God, we walk in the Spirit and the Word of God dwells in our heart richly. That's the foundation. And it's from the Word of God dwelling in our heart richly that we sing. Here's the second thing I want us to see today. Back in Colossians 3.16. Why do we sing? First of all, we sing for man. Have you ever thought of that before? We sing for one another. Look at what it says. Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, or in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So one of the reasons, now this could also speak to us teaching in other ways, but one of the reasons we have met this morning and God wants us to sing is so we can teach and admonish one another. That's what the Bible says here. One of the purposes of us doing this and being together and singing biblical hymns, biblical songs to the Lord is so we can admonish and teach one another. That's one of the joys that I got this morning as we sung some of our songs was singing it, yes, everything's to God, but singing it to each other so we all can be taught and admonished. That's one of the best ways that people, that let little kids learn is by song. But it's one of the best ways adults learn too is by song. We learn by songs. And sometimes we may not be able to quote a big grouping of Scriptures together and be able to quote a large section of Scripture, but we can quote a song. That's one reason it's so important as we sing to the Lord whatever, doesn't matter what century it comes from, I'm for the good new stuff, I'm for all good songs that the church has used before. That is according to Scripture. I'm for all that. But we need to sing these things in mind to help one another. They need to be biblical. Now, if we are to teach and admonish each other as we sing, our music can't be thumping too loud. Why is that? It's because maybe you've gone... I've not personally gone... I've heard of them before, but I've not personally been to a church like this, but you can hear the music from the parking lot. There's vibration going on. Why... Why are we not going to do that in our worship services? There's many reasons. One reason is this. If I can't hear you for the music, I can't teach and admonish you when I sing. Does that make sense? If I can't hear myself think, well, you can't hear myself speak, and my words can no longer admonish and teach you. Now, I'm, I'm for good music. I'm for that. But what I'm saying is the music cannot control and cannot overpower the singing. It's the words, it's the truth that we are after. Because that truth changes our heart and makes us into the people that God wants us to be. God wants us to sing together, therefore our songs must be relevantly easy to sing together, right? Some of the songs maybe you hear on Christian radio and they're really good, and they'd be fine for a special, may not be fine for us all to sing together because they're too difficult for us all to sing together, too complicated. So when we sing as a congregation, for the most part at least, they need to be easy songs to sing together. Now somebody hears this and they say to themselves, but Brother Clint, I can drive in my car by myself and be taught and edified and admonished as I listen to singing. And that's right. And I say praise the Lord for that. Amen. We can be. And yet... God has ordained that in His church we come together and sing to one another. It's one of the ways that God has ordained to bless His people. 
So we must do that together. Now, let me give you two examples here of what we sung this morning, of admonishing and teaching one another. Listen to a few of the lyrics. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Is that right? We sung that to each other this morning. What about this? Awake my soul and sing of Him who died for thee. And hail Him as thy matchless King through all eternity. I make reference to this first part. Awake my soul and sing. We're saying that to ourselves, but we're saying that to everyone else. We're saying, awake! Let our souls awake! We're in the presence of God and we're here to sing His praises. Awake my soul and sing. So when we gather together and sing, we are singing for each other. I hope that that has helped me. I hope it helps you all to think about that. When we sing, yes, I'm singing to God, but I'm singing to everyone here. Here's the third thing I want us to see. Is that when we sing, yes, we must sing for man, but we must sing for God. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, these different types of songs, singing with thankfulness or with grace in your hearts to God. Some Bibles say, Lord, there. So when we come together, I'm singing to you all and you're singing to me. But we are also singing to God when we sing. We're letting our praises be known. We're thankful in our heart. There's grace in our heart. Our heart is engaged. Again, if my whole week I've wasted on the things of this world, my heart is not going to be ready for this morning unless I come back to God and repent of the things I've done. And God can then restore us and get us ready to worship. I said this a couple weeks ago. I'm going to say it again. I was listening to a man, and this man was talking about worship. And here's what he was talking about. He said, how many times or so we we leave service and we say, you know what, I really like that about service. Or we say, you know what, I didn't really like that about service. But how many times do we ever say, I wonder if God liked that today? Because when we gather together, now we should enjoy the songs. Yes, there's secondary blessings, of course. Yes. But when we gather together, we're not here for us, are we? Not primarily. We're not here primarily to feel good. Though we all want to feel good. When we gather together as Christians to worship God, we are here first and foremost for God. We are here to worship Him and we want to give our worship to Him in a way that's pleasing to Him. Again, that's why our songs to the Lord and to everyone else must be biblically saturated, must be accurate, must be true, must honor God. Even the tunes. There's, let's just say, for instance, someone takes an old song and puts it to a new tune and the tune is completely off and foreign to the meaning of the song. Those are all things that people have to watch out for. We want everything to give honor and glory to the Lord. And let me give you a few examples of our singing this morning as we sung what we were saying to the Lord. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. We sung that to the Lord today. Or what about this? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. We've got a friend in Jesus today. and We praise Him for that. We praise the Lord. To Thee be endless praise, for Thou, 
For us has died. Be Thou, O Lord, through endless days adored and magnified. Let the name of God be magnified. Let it be magnified. Listen to what the psalmist says on this point about worship of God and the magnification of His name. The psalmist says, My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. One more from this morning. Help me then in every tribulation so to trust Thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within Thy holy Word. It's a prayer to God. It's worship to God. We come, we sing to each other, but we sing to God. It's worship. We come together, let our voices rise up and sing unto the Lord. And then fourthly this morning, why do we need this for? Why do we need to be taught and admonished Through song for. Why do we need this as Christian people? Life is tough, isn't it? Temptations and trials abound. Difficulties abound. The lost man says, well, I'm not a Christian. I don't need this singing. The lost man's just that. He's lost. He's blind in his sin. The devil has a hold of him. He already belongs to the devil. But as I, have, well, as I found out when I started serving the Lord, before you started serving the Lord, the devil didn't bother you that much. But once you start serving the Lord, you have an enemy of your soul that's alive and active more so than you thought before. We need this, don't we? There is a heaven to gain, a hell to shun. There is judgment coming. Both judgment unto salvation for the righteous. And we need to be encouraged on our way to, yes, my heart has grown cold. I need to come back and repent and give my heart anew and afresh to the Lord. Yes, I have given in to sin and temptation. Oh, I hear my brothers and sisters singing. I hear these lyrics. I can't say them unless my heart is right with God. I've got to become right with God. I remember in my own life years ago, I was doing something that was, that was wrong. My conscience was bothering me. And at the end of the service, while, while the singing was going on, I was standing in my, my spot in the pew and I asked God to forgive me for it and the peace that came over my soul. We need to hear these things. I remember one professor in college, he, he wrote about how when he became converted, it was like all the songs he had heard in his past came to him at that time. He said something like that. He heard, he could remember these things, they came back to him. And it helped him become a Christian at that moment. These songs help us go the other mile and continue on. How many of you love the Psalms? That's 150 inspired hymns. That's what they are. That's the hymn book of Israel that they sung. They needed it. And we need it as well. So life is tough. Heaven and hell is real. But here's another reason we need this. And we must do it. Is because He is worthy of it. The Lord Jesus Christ, as I turn to Revelation chapter 5, Sometimes we talk about heaven on earth, don't we? We talk about, well, that, that time if my family was heaven on earth. And we talk about, you know, that time we had at such and such place, it was like heaven on earth. Well, what are they doing in heaven? What would earth look like if, if heaven came down? I want you to listen to verse 11 through 14 of chapter 5 of Revelation. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands 
saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb. And it doesn't matter what I feel like right now or you feel like, He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. If you want to to see how, how can our worship services be heaven on earth, you get a glimpse there. Worship of God and of His Son. Bowing down, whether physically or in our heart, before the Lord. And I can say this because I know it's true because I've, I've dealt and have to deal with it in my own life. If we want to come on the Lord's day ready to worship God, we have to worship Him every day. Amen. Here's the good news. God not only wants that, but God will help us do that, brothers and sisters. He'll help us be prepared to worship Him.